I thought I knew how this would end. But here I am, running for my life. Or is it running from my life? Running from everything I thought to be true. I betrayed my truest friend. Left him a prisoner. A dying king. Carrying a burden he didn't deserve. My master is betrayed. My hope is lost. I thought I knew how this would end, but I didn't understand because I wasn't really looking. I thought I knew how this would end, but here I am waiting. He's gone. And now all hope is lost. What happens next? When all hope is lost, there is no next. There is no running. Only waiting. Frozen in time while the world moves on around me. You said you would never leave me. But where are you now? How long, God, will you hide your face? When will you remember your promise? I love studying history. You know, one thing you'll notice if you study history is that we're really all not all that unusual. History has a habit of repeating itself, going in circles. A couple statements from different people. Will we, William Wilberforce, picture that we have on the screen there. He's one of the leaders of the, the group who worked to abolish slavery in England, right? In 1801, he refused to get married. Why? He said, I dare not marry. The future is so unsettled. William Pitt, another English statesman, was just depressed about the state of things in the world. He remarked in 1806, there is scarcely anything around us but ruin and despair. Lord Shaftesbury, yet another English statesman, in 1848, he declared, nothing can save the British Empire from shipwreck. Nothing. In 1849, Benjamin Disraeli, known to be one of the greatest English statesmen, he said, in industry, in commerce, in agriculture, there is no hope. In 1852, the Duke of Wellington, who won the Battle of Waterloo, said, in his very last hours, listen to what he says, I thank God I shall be spared from seeing the consummation of ruin that is gathering around us. And we, we aren't, as Americans, uh, immune from this is in 1860 our president Buchanan said indeed all hope seems to have deserted the minds of men 
Now, some of you may be wondering whether these statements actually came from the 1800s or they were spoken today. <laughs> they all seem to be so familiar. Maybe they're not talking about building a fence along the Mexican border or anything like that, but they all seem so familiar. Compare their thoughts to, to one of our modern-day philosophers, Chicken Little, who once said, what? The sky is falling. See, you know him too. But there seems to be this trend towards pessimism in our world today, doesn't there? Have you noticed that? Now, often this kind of attitude, this pessimistic attitude, it can affect people's lives. It can limit their potential. When someone is dejected, when someone is, has lost their hope, they can fall into a funk of types. And it really prevents them from moving forward in life. Have you ever been there? There's a story about Thomas Edison that illustrates this. He was in the process of discovering the way to record and reproduce the sound of human voice on a machine, something that we'd probably call the record player, right? Edison worked on this, this project long enough that he had a pretty good idea how the machine was going to work, so he calls in his model maker, and he hands his model maker this rough sketch in pencil of his idea, and he asks this man to make a working model of this, of this, this thing. Well, the model maker took one look at that sketch, and he said, impossible. There is no way <laughs> that a machine can do this. There's never been a machine that could talk. Well, Edison, in spite of this pessimistic attitude, he kept his hope. And he determinedly said to the man, build what I have sketched here and let me be the loser if it doesn't work. So the model, the model maker decided to trust Edison and the rest is history, right? Now, some of you are probably asking, well, what's a record player? But that's not really the point of the story. When you think about history, when you think about this story, the model maker had already decided in his mind that Edison's invention wasn't going to work. And if it was up left up to him, it definitely wouldn't have, right? Because he didn't believe it would work. It didn't fit into his box of how the world works. He had no hope that it would work. Yet Edison's hope, Edison's hope was strong enough for the both of them, wasn't it? <laughs> hope is a very powerful thing. Hope can motivate us. Hope can give us a vision of a preferable future. In hope, we define how our lives should turn out, how our world should be going. It keeps us moving forward in things. But not having hope, that can be just as powerful, can't it? It can be devastating to a person. When, a hope, when our hope is shattered, despair sets into us. Nothing seems to make sense to us. We just can't see how things are going to turn out for the good. There's just no way. Have you ever been there? Maybe some of you are there right now. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 24? Luke 24. We've been following the story of Jesus and his disciples the last few weeks, and last week we finally got to the part of the story where Jesus died. Jesus died on the cross. And <laughs> Jesus' followers had a hope of how things were going to turn out with Jesus in the world, but I can honestly tell you that it didn't include Jesus dying, did it? That wasn't in their, in their plans at all. They had this idea of what the Messiah was to be, and, and, and their Messiah was going to be this strong military leader who would come in and would save them from the tyranny of the Romans who were d depressing, pressing down on their people. This, this Messiah, he would come in and he would sit on his throne and he would br finally bring peace to their country in good times. There really was no room for this Messiah to die. This view of Messiah, he couldn't die. He was all-powerful. And they'd spent the last three years of their lives, these disciples, hoping, more than hoping. They knew that Jesus was the Messiah. 
They were sure that he was the answer to their problems. But this last week, this last week of Jesus' this life, it just brought devastation to their ideas, devastation to their hope. How could God allow Jesus to die like this? Jesus, I mean, how could he die like this if he was the Messiah? Well, maybe he wasn't the Messiah. And then the question would be, how in the world did we get led astray to follow an imposter like this? Why would God allow that to happen? The crucifixion, it, it broke the disciples. Broke them. They put everything that they believed into question. Everything that they had hoped. It really rocked their world, didn't it? How could they ever trust again? How could they ever trust the truth again? Have you ever been there? As we re read in the earlier service, following the death of Jesus, or not earlier service, but earlier in the service, following the death of Jesus, there were some women who went to the tomb on Sunday morning to anoint Jesus' body, his dead body. And to, to their surprise, they found the stone that sealed the tomb rolled away. And they went inside the tomb, and they found that there was no body in there. And two men, two angels, appeared to them and told them that Jesus wasn't there. He's risen. But was that enough to restore the hopes of the disciples? Let's read beginning with verse 9 of Luke 24. It says, When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven disciples, to all the others, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. When the women returned from the tomb <laughs> to share what they had seen, you can kind of sense the attitude of the men, couldn't you? Nonsense. It's crazy. You guys don't know what you're talking about. They're not going to fall for this again. They'd already put their hopes in Jesus. They weren't going to do it again. They had truly lost hope. When Peter arrived at the empty tomb, all, all he could do was just wonder. He wasn't going to take another stab at faith. Peter had already tried that with Jesus and failed. This time was going to be different. He's going to wait for a little bit more proof, right? Peter was pretty certain that he wasn't very certain about things. But let's keep reading. Verse 13, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were, walk they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. What was happening? They, they were just kind of meandering down the road, wondering what had just happened to them. They were confused. They were probably in a state of despondency and depression. You could have probably seen it in their, in their posture, how, the way, how they were carrying themselves down the road. I just can't believe that Jesus let us down. How could we be so stupid to believe in him? To waste a few years of our lives on this guy. I just can't believe it. Then in verse 15 it says, As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. So Jesus himself actually came on the scene here. Now, what kept them from recognizing Jesus? I think it was their pessimistic attitude, their depression, their disillusionment, their hopelessness. We don't know. But I think it's important to see how Jesus responds to this situation. He could have been pretty frustrated with these guys for not getting it. I mean, he'd spent three years of his life investing in them. How could they not 
get it. <laughs> but you see how he responds. The Bible says that he came up and he walked along with them. He came up and he walked along with them. The Greek here literally means that Jesus drew near and he journeyed with them. Isn't that a great response? Aren't you glad that you serve a God who's willing to come alongside of us when we're weak, when we're frustrated, when we don't know for sure what's supposed to be happening here, we're a little depressed, we're struggling? A God who knows that we're hurting and draws near to us. Verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Again, you could see the despair, the downtrodden, the hopelessness in them. One of them, verse 18, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus asked, What things? <laughs> Why would Jesus ask such a question? You know that he knows what's happened. It happened to him, right? Well, I believe that he was actually preparing their hearts and minds to be taught. He wanted to hear from them what, their, what they believed about the situation so that he could speak into those things. And what did they believe? Well, continuing on in the passage about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers, they handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. They had hoped that Jesus would be the Messiah. That Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel from the Romans. But now Jesus is just a prophet to them. Just a teacher who lived and died but we had hoped, we'd hoped proof that their hope was shattered. Verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and they told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions, they went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But Jesus, they, they didn't see. You notice how they were just stating the facts. They weren't going to jump into any, any conclusions, right? They weren't going to admit that Jesus was probably alive. But notice Jesus' response in verse 25. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? You see Jesus here chastising them a little bit for not knowing their scriptures, for not looking at the whole story, for not believing all that the prophets had spoken. Have you ever <laughs> just sought out and found just part of the story before? If you've ever Googled anything, <laughs> you've heard part of the story. And that's what these guys were doing. They knew part of the story. They hadn't investigated to find all of the story. Jesus is saying, how could you miss that it was required for the Christ to suffer and then to enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Did you see where Jesus pointed them to when they were full of doubt? He didn't point them to man's opinions about Jesus. Didn't tell them to think about it and process through it and think about it from their own opinion, what they thought about Jesus. Look at the scriptures. What does God say about the Messiah? Now keep in mind, they still don't know who this guy is, right? They don't know he's Jesus. They're just journeying along this road with this guy. And verse 28 says, as they approached the village to where they were going, to it, Jesus act, acted as if he was going on for, farther. If they wanted Jesus to stick around, they were going to have to ask him to stick around. Right? That's what the story is telling us here. That Jesus requires an invitation. 
even when our faith is weak. Hmm. Is there any possibility that they could include in their life script a suffering Christ? Would they ever make that sense in their minds? I mean, this wasn't something that they'd been taught since they were a kid. They, they would have really had a tough time with this teaching. Would they reject this teacher, this guy that was offering this other opinion about the story? How do you respond when Jesus changes your life script, when Jesus changes your understanding of hopes and dreams? What do these two disciples decide? Well, verse 29, it says, They urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. They didn't, did in fact decide to invite Jesus in, didn't they? Even though they didn't know who he was, even though they were struggling with this idea of the suffering Christ, the suffering Messiah, they didn't quite understand everything. They're still struggling through this doubt. And you notice that Jesus went in to stay with them, right? When Jesus is invited, he comes in. Even when we're not 100% sure about things, when he's invited, he comes in. He carries us through those moments of struggles. He's not expecting us to have it all together. <laughs> he wants us to invite him in. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, later on that evening, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he began to give it to them. Something that they were familiar with, right? Something that just happened a few nights before. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Now that's just a simple little verse <laughs> that stayed there, but wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine being there for that? The two were down in the dumps. The two were thinking that everything was going wrong in their life. They were full of doubt. They were not certain about anything. They invite this stranger in, this one who's kind of come alongside of them on the journey, and then Jesus reveals himself. He breaks this bread that he did a few days earlier. He again emphasizes what? The suffering Christ, the suffering Messiah. His body broken for them. And all of a sudden, this great big light bulb comes up, right? And they realize that it's Jesus who's there. Can you imagine the hair standing up on the back of their neck? When they realized just who it was who was with them? Now remember, he, they thought he was dead. There's a dead guy sitting at the table. I mean, there's movies about this, right? Total shock, mouth-dropping amazement. Whoa, this is Jesus. Holy cow. Now notice that they thought that Jesus had tricked them, that he had brought this disillusionment and pain into their life, that he had abandoned them, that he had left them when he died. But Jesus, he was right there with them. Even in those moments of doubt, when they didn't believe it, he was right there with them. All they had to do was open their eyes. Has that ever happened to you? Where you look back on something, a situation, and you realize that God was involved? And then Jesus is gone. But the disappearing, really, there's not a whole lot of mention of that. They're not shocked about that. They're still talking about that he was there. Verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking, talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. Why were they going back to Jerusalem? They had to, they had to tell the disciples. We have to tell them. They're excited, right? They had to tell them what had happened. So they take off to Jerusalem 
It's a seven-mile trip. Remember, it's late in the evening, so you're running back there in the middle of the night. You can kind of sense the energy coming back into the room, right? Their hope is being reborn. The presence of Jesus has brought hope to their life. And off they go. There they find the eleven and those with them, assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon Peter. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I mean, they didn't have to get to the house and wake up the disciples and say, Hey, we have something to tell you. They're in the, it's in the middle of the night. They're celebrating. They're having a party celebrating that they've seen the risen Savior. And then these two guys, they come in and they get to tell their story. And it's just a big party, isn't it? They're celebrating into the night. Reminds me of our college students. In fact, if you keep reading in the story, you see that Jesus joins their party, celebrating that they've seen the risen Savior. Jesus is, is alive. Their hope has been restored. Their motivation for life, it's back. Now, it's not the same plan that they were thinking it was. Not the same life script. Things were probably going to be a little tougher than their original plan. But Jesus, their hope, has returned. He's back in their lives. Now think about this. If they had gotten what they wanted, they would have gotten the Christ that would, would have won a military victory over Rome and would have provided some freedom for them, political freedom for a time. But what did they get instead? With this Christ, the Messiah. He won a victory over sin, bringing us freedom, not just for a time, but for all time, forever. Hope not just for this life, but forever. Now, which one would you choose? <laughs> God knows what he's doing. And there are times when we think we know what we're doing, and, and we don't. I'll openly admit that. <laughs> We don't always see the big picture of things. We don't always see all that God is doing in a particular situation. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't follow our ideas, our hopes, our dreams, that he goes with his plan? Can we trust him? What about you? Is your script in life, your hopes, not quite going as planned? Have you lost hope? Are you willing to allow Jesus to, to draw near to you, journey with you, to be a part of your life? Maybe you're wondering where Jesus is in all this stuff that you're going through. Have you really checked to see if he's already there with you? He cares about us. He knows when we're hurting. And he has great plans for us, doesn't he? He has great plans for you if we're willing to trust him. Are you willing to let him teach you a thing or two about hopes and dreams? Are you willing to allow him to teach you a few things about life? What it really is about. Even when things seem so chaotic, out of control, hopeless. Are you willing to recognize Jesus not as some teacher, some prophet that has come and died, but as the Christ, the Savior of the world, the Savior of your life, who sits at the right hand of God. <laughs> Are you willing to exchange your hope for God's hope? Jesus is walking by. We invite him in. Maybe you once believed that Jesus was the hope. Maybe you have some struggles with that. You've had some hard times. The worries of this life, the distractions, the busyness, whatever it might be, the focus is off of God and onto other things. Where did he go during my time of trouble? Is it time to clear away the clutter? Is it time to refocus 
on him. Jesus is walking by. Will you invite him in? Let's finish the story we started earlier. I thought I knew how this would end. But I wasn't really looking. so thankful that you're a God who cares about us, who's interested in us, who has plans for us. And Lord, there are times when life gets in the way, when we lose our focus, when we struggle, when we find ourselves in depression, hopeless. But Lord God, you, you are our hope. You are what we need. You are there for us. Lord God, we are so thankful for sending your son to pay the price for us so that we could find forgiveness of our sins. If we would just invite you in, that you have taken care of all of our past. But Lord, we are also wanting a new beginning. This is not the ending. This is the beginning of new life, Lord the possibilities of life with you, the possibilities of joy and hope and love, significance. Lord God, would you just help us to open our eyes to see you at work around us? Would you help us to see that you have been there for us? Would you help us to cry out to you to be a part of our lives? We need you, Lord. You are a rock, our hope. In Jesus' name, amen.